Hey, this is Mr. Weisenfeld. We're back. Today we're going to talk about the history of the atom. So grab a handout, grab a pencil or pen, and let's get started. When you're talking about the history of atoms, what you're thinking about are scientists uh, over the years and their contributions to the model of the atom. Uh, when uh, you want to know some more stuff about chemistry, there's a couple of folks on the internet, on YouTube especially, that are brilliant. So check out two guys, Bozeman Science, he's a high school teacher in Montana, Paul Anderson, and Tyler DeWitt, uh, also on the internet. Uh, let me just play you a snippet of these guys so you can uh, get a feel for it and see if it would be useful to you uh, when you need to know something. Hi, this is Mr. Anderson, and today I'm going to be talking about atoms and elements. Uh, this here is a picture of helium, and if we look at helium right here, um, you know that this is the nucleus here in the center. Um, to give you an idea of scale, the nucleus, which is going to be this tiny bit right down here, is actually measured in femtometers, and so that is 10 to the negative 15th um, meters. In other words, um, this is really small, the angstrom unit here, um, but atoms are incredibly small. So in this podcast, what I'm going to talk about is the history of atoms, how, we, how it came to be known that there exists an atom, and then finally we'll talk about uh, what are protons, neutrons, and electrons, and then how they're organized. Okay. All right, so that was Mr. Anderson. Uh, really good stuff. He covers everything from biology to all sorts of stuff. Now here's Tyler DeWitt. Check him out. As scientists have done experiments and learned more and more about atoms, they've changed the way they think about atoms. So in this video, we're going to look at a timeline of the different ways that scientists have pictured or imagined atoms over the years. Now the okay, so that was Tyler DeWitt. You got to check him out sometime. Uh, on your piece of paper, so you got this handout. You've got uh, four columns. Uh, scientist column, the year column, ideas, and then the atomic model. Put your name at the top, put the period. Uh, first column is the scientists. So we're going to talk about eight scientists here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, we're going to write down what years they were uh, doing their research, uh, thinking about atoms. And then we're going to talk about some of their ideas that they had. So uh, number one, first up, uh, uh, take a look here. Uh, zoom in on 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, center of the screen there. That's where most of this stuff with the atom is going on. But our first guy, Democritus, over here, 460 to 370 BC, Greek guy, uh, he is proposing an atomic theory that actually holds up to this day. So let's check him out. Democritus, he's number one. Picture? Okay. So, write down the year in your, uh, in your sheet, and then uh, some of his ideas. So I just highlighted a few things that you might write down. Uh, first of all, he's got his atomic theory, and he's talking that atoms are small, they're hard, they're indivisible, and they're indestructible. Furthermore, everything is made of these, and uh, even though, let's see, yeah, particles made of single, okay, so they make different shapes and sizes. And you know, Aristotle, uh, another guy at the time didn't really agree with them, but uh, it just goes to show uh, some scientists don't know everything. Here's another little bit about Democritus you can listen to. Suppose you have a small particle or a grain of sand and a fine knife, and you divide the grain of sand in half, and then in half again, and then in half again. Is there an end to this process, or must you reach a limit, an indivisible particle? Democritus, the 5th century BC Greek philosopher, imagined that it was illogical that this process of subdivision of matter could continue without end. And so he proposed that all matter was made of atoms, indivisible, microscopic units of matter, comprising all the things we know in the natural world. This was a very advanced idea because Democritus had no way of isolating or seeing individual atoms. But the idea was very modern because it's the basis of modern science, that the properties of matter, such as color, taste, odor, are secondary properties, and the fundamental properties apply to atoms themselves. Democritus also speculated that the fundamental particles of matter, atoms, were in constant motion, something we also knew to be true today. 
And so Democritus, 2,000 years before atoms were actually seen, hypothesis the microscopic nature of the natural world. Well, I think I meant to say, he meant to say probably hypothesized. That'd be the, uh, the correct uh, word. But anyway, uh, the point is Democritus, he hits this home run. I mean, the guy uh, with no kind of uh, experiment, he's just kind of thinking and logically getting to uh, a lot of what we know about the atom today. So let's go back. Who's next up? Number two. Uh, is this a guy named Antoine Lavoisier? French guy. And he's making a, m a bunch of contributions to chemistry. So let's check him out. Here's his picture. That's his wife there. Father of modern chemistry. He, uh, he finds 33 elements. Metric system. Uh, marries Marie-Anne Pirette Palze. Uh, he's a tax collector. Oh, they chop off his head. He's guillotined during the French Revolution. Uh, he, he finds out that combustion, a very specific word in chemistry, is when oxygen is combining with elements. And furthermore, he's talking about the law of conservation of mass. So if you got that on your piece of paper, Lavoisier, uh, 1743 to 1794 is the years, he finds 33 elements, he discovers combustion, is when oxygen is combining. Law of conservation of matter says that uh, in a chemical reaction, uh, matter is neither created nor destroyed. So that's the key. That's the key thing to remember. And then here's a little bit more about him or a little bit of repeating if you're looking for one more fact. Check this out. Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier was a French chemist and biologist who first organized the list of chemical elements. Lavoisier was born in Paris, and after his mother died he inherited the family fortune. He was educated in Paris and was expected to follow his father's career in law, but instead opted for a career in science. Lavoisier's passion was for chemistry, but he also studied geology, and worked on the first geological map of France in 1769. Lavoisier married his 13-year-old wife, Marianne, when he was 28, and she helped translate documents and created sketches for him throughout his career. During his experiments, Lavoisier discovered the role of oxygen in respiration in plants and animals, and gave a name to the gas hydrogen. He also discovered that oxygen and hydrogen combined made water. He explained that air, which was previously thought to be an element, was actually a mixture of gases, and devised the system of chemical nomenclature, or naming, which is still used to this day. He also wrote the first ever chemistry textbook. He conducted chemical experiments and carefully weighed the chemicals and the products, and stated that changes of matter in an experiment do not change the mass of the matter used during the process. He clarified elements and compounds, and also explained the results of other scientists' work with his theories. Lavoisier also worked as a tax collector, where he attempted to introduce reforms to the French taxation system. He was accused of being a traitor by the rulers of France at the time, and was convicted and executed by guillotine along with other tax collectors in 1794. His death was mourned by the French mathematician Joseph Lagrange, who said, It took them only an instant to cut off his head, but France may not produce another such head in a century. He was pardoned posthumously 18 months after his death, and is still referred to as the father of modern chemistry. All right. Hey, so he's no slacker, Lavoisier. The guy uh, is in doing incredible stuff. All right, so that was number two. Hey, if you need to write down, you got to pause it and then write some stuff down. Okay, we're moving on. Uh, number two was Lavoisier. Number three uh, is a guy named John Dalton. So he's working 1766 to 1844. He's proposing an atomic theory. Uh, so check it out. Picture. Here's a few points uh, about his atomic theory. You can uh, put down atomic theory on your paper here under number three. And his atomic theory says all substances are made of atoms. They're small, they can't be uh, created, divided, or destroyed. So that's point number one. Point number two, atoms of the same element are exactly alike. So we know that. Different elements, different atoms. And then atoms join with other uh, atoms to make new substances. So just cut those bullet points down on your uh, worksheet. He's got the atomic weights. Uh, so he's actually weighing these elements, figuring out what the... Remember, atomic weight is that ratio... Uh, uh, well, it's if you call carbon 12, uh, you compare other things to carbon. He was a teacher, colorblind, okay, so uh, couldn't tell 
blue from uh, red, I imagine. And so that was uh, John Dalton, number three. Okay, moving ahead, number four. Uh, he's a guy named J.J. Thompson. You can call him J.J. Uh, he's discovering the electron, and he has something called the plum pudding model. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's a way to describe the atom. So here we go, J.J. Thompson. So he's the first guy that says, actually, you can divide the atom into smaller parts. So fundamentally, kind of a switch from the previous guys. He is... Uh, He's doing cathode ray tubes, so old-fashioned televisions uh, with those big tubes. Same thing, cathode ray tube. It's about electrons zooming through a vacuum and hitting a screen to make some light. He's calling these little things uh, that are in the cathode ray tube zooming past he electrons. He says that the atom is neutral. So this is bullet point number three on your worksheet. And then he's saying the atom is like a plum pudding so it's mostly positive charge which is little bits like plum pieces uh, that are negatively charged and JJ uh, Thompson's winning the Nobel Prize so uh, you've got this filled out remember you're only filling out the first three columns on your worksheet and then we're gonna come back and hit the fourth column later so uh, so that's number four JJ Thompson number five We've got a guy, uh, Ernest Rutherford, and he's doing something called the gold foil experiment. Let's check that out. First of all, here's a picture. Uh, he's doing the gold foil experiment, which is basically you take uh, some radioactive element and you shoot these radioactive particles uh, against a piece of foil, so a very thin sheet of gold foil and uh, he's learning the following things. So here we are, we're on number five, Ernst Rutherford. You gotta turn your sheet over. Uh, he's, uh, first bullet, gold foil experiment. He says the following things about atoms, three points. Uh, I'll let you take a look here at the three points. Small core nucleus is what the atom has. The nucleus is made up of particles, which are protons. Protons are surrounded by negative charge, which is electrons. He does some incredibly uh, early work on radioactivity, and he is called sometimes the father of nuclear physics. Nuclear, you know, from the same word, nucleus, the center of the atom. And he's winning a Nobel Prize as well. So, uh, and he was a student of the previous guy, J.J. Thompson. So these guys all kind of work together uh, in England. And this guy's also on the New Zealand $100 bill. So if you have to write down some facts for this guy, you're set. All right. That's number five. Number six. Who we got for number six? Uh, 1850, 1885 to 1962, Niels Bohr. Uh, Danish guy, Niels. Uh, he's got his own model of the atom in 1913. But let's check him out. What do we got? Uh, number six. Here's what the Bohr model says uh, quite a bit about the, the atom. Electrons are going zooming around the nucleus, and they are in definite paths called orbits, kind of like the moon is in an orbit around the Earth. And uh, furthermore, he's saying that electrons, uh, they might not stay in a particular orbit. They may jump back and forth between one level and the next as they go around the atom. So that's the Bohr model. Let's see. Bohr's also winning a Nobel Prize. And Bohr works with Rutherford. So Bohr works with Rutherford, previous guy, number five. Rutherford's working with J.J. Thompson, number four. And uh, this is like one of some of the most productive uh, time for the atom uh, in history. All right, so that's number six, Niels Bohr. Number seven. We've got a guy named Erwin Schrödinger, a uh, German dude, and he's doing the electron cloud in 1926. Sorry about that, I kind of covered that up, but let's check out what uh, Schrödinger is saying. Picture? All right. Uh, he's saying, uh, so he's disagreeing with Bohr. He's basically saying, you cannot tell me where the electron is exactly. Uh, 
So uh, that's it for number seven here. So you cannot know the exact location of the electron. Uh, he calls these areas where the electrons are electron clouds. So instead of thinking of an electron like beep, this one little thing is like buzzing around so fast and so incredibly, electron clouds are these uh, kind of where this electron is. Uh, kind of, I know somewhat where it is, but uh, precisely I can't know. So it's like this cloud, kind of this fog of of electron. And then he is doing uh, he he. Uh, so side note to this is. Electrons, are they particles? Or are they waves? This is connected with modern physics. This is uh, called quantum mechanics. This guy uh, deals with another guy called Heisenberg talking about uh, what is really an electron when we get right down to it. You want to know about more about that, you can take physics. You want to take physics, you can talk to Mr. Weisenfeld sometime in your uh, junior or senior year. Cool. Physics. All right. He's also got a Nobel Prize uh, for some of the work that he did. All right, so that's number seven, Schrodinger. Uh, you should be able to tell me uh, one more fact about him, and then you should be able to tell me a little bit about uh, how his model differs from the previous guy. So, okay, so that's number seven. Here we go, number eight. Guy named James Chadwick. All right, so. Uh, you guys are familiar with the nucleus of the atom, the protons in the nucleus, you're familiar with electrons now. This guy, 1891 to 1974, so uh, he is still alive in the 70s, and uh, he's got the neutron. So let's check out what uh, Mr. Chadwick says. And we're number eight, last one. So here's what, he's looking at the, uh, he's looking at the periodic table, just like you or me, and he's saying, uh, the atomic mass is like almost double the number of protons. Like, what's up with that? And so, boom, neutron. Uh, a little bit more complicated than that. He has to have an experiment. He has to figure out uh, some of the, He has to characterize. In other words, he has to describe the neutron in more detail. But he's got it right there in 1932. He worked on the Manhattan Project. That was the government's plan to make a bomb in World War II, a nuclear bomb. He works with Rutherford, so remember, Bohr works with Rutherford, who works with J.J. Thompson. This guy also works with Rutherford, so you can imagine uh, when you've got a good teacher, you uh, you have an amazing impact on people and how they think about stuff. So, okay, uh, those are guys one through eight. Now, take your piece of paper, go back to the first page. Uh, uh, we're going to make little sketches here in column number four. So go to column number four, and here we go. We're going to summarize it uh, in the following way. So fill in the fourth column with a little bit of a sketch on the progression of the atomic model. And we're going to show you here what that, uh, what that model should look like. And then we're going to make sure down here that you remember who is saying what about the atom. So first up, Democritus, the Greek dude, and Dalton. They basically say, atoms they're small you can't divide them up they're uh they're kind of just these little particles that's it that's as far as you can go there's nothing else beyond that next up jj thompson he says okay i gotcha uh turns out uh the atom is neutral i got that it's mostly positive uh and this is plum pudding right but there's little bits of negative inside that particle that's mostly positive. So it's still kind of a particle, solid little BB or whatever, little um, sphere or something, but that's what we got. Next up, Rutherford, he says, hang on, uh, Rutherford, he's doing the gold foil experiment, remember? He's saying, uh, you know what, uh, you've got a positive nucleus, pretty uh, concentrated, and then you've got these electrons, they're swarming around the outside, well, they're just outside. He's not saying swarming yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, next up, Bohr. Bohr says, hey, I, I think the electrons there are in very specific spots. They're uh, doing circles around this positive nucleus, and they're at very particular uh, distances away. And if they jump back and forth, they make something called light. But uh, we'll talk about that later. All right. 
Next up, Schrodinger he says, nope, ha, uh, boar, you can't say that you know exactly where they are. They are swarming around. They're going so fast, and they're going so crazy in their paths that they, you know, they're a cloud. They're like just this nebulous thing of electrons. But you still got a nucleus. We're good on the nucleus. It's still positive. We don't know much about the inside of that. And we haven't said much about the inside of that until this guy comes along. Boom. Chadwick, he says, all right. I got your electron cloud, I'm good with that, but your nucleus has got positive charges and then these other things, neutrons, which are uh, no charge and uh, they're in the nucleus as well. So he's digging into the nucleus, he's showing you what's up and, uh, and that is it for the progression of the atomic model. You've got your worksheet, uh, uh, give it to Mr. Weisenfeld uh, with your name on it and you're good for today, thank you. Uh, until 